on its domain F inverse, the inverse of F, will also be continuous. on its respective domain but keep in mind that the domain of F inverse is the range of your original function you switch X and Y right so the range becomes domain domain becomes range so if f is continuous on its domain, f inverse will also be continuous on its respective domain, but that is the range of your original function, the range of f. Okay, in the last minute that we have, let me give you one quick example. Let's just say f of x is x cubed. Uh, is x cubed a polynomial? Yes. That means it's continuous everywhere. So it's continuous on the entire domain, uh, entire real number system. So it's a polynomial. It's continuous on negative infinity to infinity. It's range. What's its range? What's its range? Oh, not just that. Uh, it also goes from negative infinity to infinity. Yeah, all real numbers. So if we found the inverse, do you remember how to find the inverse? Yeah, you, well, you make y equals x cubed. You switch your variables. x equals y cubed. You solve for your y. The cube root of x equals y. And therefore, f inverse of x equals the cube root of x. Here's what, that's cube root. Here's what I know about this already. I, I, don't, I, I know that for a fact, because this is the inverse of this polynomial, I don't have to do any more work with it. I guarantee you that that's continuous on the range of my original function. So because the range of my function was negative infinity to infinity, not the domain, I'm not really concerned about that. That's a polynomial, it's continuous everywhere. But my range was negative infinity to infinity. What this says is that this must be continuous from negative infinity to infinity, continuous everywhere. If the range is everything, the inverse function has a domain of everything. So it's continuous because of the range, negative infinity to infinity. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. We're going to continue talking just a little bit about some limits. Uh, one application of, of these, of, of, well, and continuity. One application of continuity we're going to talk about today is something called the intermediate value theorem. Now, here's the idea. Let's say that I gave you some continuous function. So, so it's, it's definitely a function. f of x, and I say this function is defined between a and b, or let's just put some endpoints on it, a to b. Can you tell me how high is this point? Y. It would be certainly y, but let's not make it in terms of y, let's make it in terms of f. How high would that point be? f of a is a good start. So that, that, that'd be what, how high it would be. So if this is a, how do you figure the height out is you plug that into your function, right? Or in other words, f of a. Cool. How high is this point? f of b. All right. Let's follow the pattern there. So <laughs> f of a, f of b, very good. That's our gives us our heights. Now here's the question. Firstly, let me say that f is certainly continuous. Do you see that f is continuous on the interval a, b? So f of x is continuous. In fact, since it has those endpoints, we could say it's continuous 
on the close interval as well. Here's my question. Let's suppose that I picked some random point, some arbitrary point between f of a, some arbitrary value between f of a and f of b, Let, maybe like here, and I'll call it k. So let's say that k is between f of a and f of b. Here's my question. If I find the, the input that gives me this output, if I can find the input that gives me that output, will it be between A and B? That's the question. If F is <coughs> continuous, see, here's what it says. It says if you give me any point, any value between F of A and F of B, something in here, I can guarantee you that the input that would give me that value lies between A and B. And here's how we say this is the inter intermediate value theorem. It says, uh, for any value k, for any value k, there's at least one point, at least one value between a and b that will give you that, the function of that value gives you k. So in other words, um, if k is between f of a and f of b, then there's at least one x value At least there could be more. If you if you don't have a one to one function, you could have several. There's at least one number let me call it C, okay? At least one number, we'll call it C. Such that F of C will give you K. I need to add one little part of here. Uh, there's at least one number C where C is between, that's kind of a key point, where C is between A and B. equals k. You want to hear it in plain English because that's kind of mathy, right? It says, well, say k is between f of a and f of b, then there's at least one number c where c is between a and b and f of c equals k. Now that makes perfect sense to me, but here's what it says in English for you if you're like, oh yeah, I don't really understand this. Here's what it says. If you give me any, if your if your function's continuous, that means there's no holes, there's no asymptotes, there's no jumps. You get you get me? It's a smooth curve. Uh, if if you're if you give me an output between these numbers, my input will be between these numbers. So here's my input and my output, right? For those those respective values, here's my input and my output. It says you give me an output anywhere in this range, the input must be somewhere between this range. And there's going to be at least one such that this input gives you that output. Could you pick a different point? Sure. You can pick any one of these points, but no matter what, that output is going to be mapped to at least one input. At least one. Now, if you did a, a curve like this where you, where you had that, you could have more than one, right? One, two, three, however many you wanted. Uh, you could definitely do that. If it's continuous, it'll have at least one, though. How many people understand the idea of that? And that's called the intermediate value theorem. Do you want to see kind of a cool application for this? Yes. Yeah. 
I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. You want to see? Yeah. <laughs> Here's a cool uh, application. You can actually approximate roots. You know what roots are, right? Where functions cross the x-axis. You can approximate that with this idea. Here's the, the plan. Let's say that I have this, this certain function. Um, it looks like that, though. Well, of course, this height is f of b, and that height's f of a. Here's the idea using the intermediate value theorem. You know for a fact, for a fact, that this was true, right? If I give you some specific value here, you can find me an input in this range such that that gives me that output. Are you with me on that? You can give me any specific output that you want to, and I can find you the input that's in this range. You understand that? Here's what it says for this. It says, let's suppose that you know that f of a is positive and f of b is negative. So in other words, the signs are different. If the signs are different, then what you know for sure is that it crosses the x-axis, right? In other words, it says that if I say, find me the point of zero, that's an intermediate value right there, right? It's between those values. If I say, find me the, the input that gives me zero, we, we need to, or we know for sure that that actually exists. If our signs are different, then of course we cross the x-axis, right? And according to the intermediate value theorem, it says, well, you're continuous, right? Your signs are, are different. So if we're going from positive to negative according to our, our interval of outputs, then zero's got to be between those because we went from positive to negative. So I can, I can say with certainty, according to the intermediate value theorem, that there is going to be an input such that f of that input will give me an output of zero. Let me write some of that out for you so that you have that. It says that if your signs are different, f of a and f of b have different signs. If you ever thought about two things having different signs, then you know zero will be between those two numbers, true? If I say uh, negative anything and positive anything, you know that zero is between them, yes? If zero is between them, that means you're, you can apply the intermediate value theorem. If zero is between them, then you must have a certain input that will give you zero. That's applied uh, that using the internet intermediate value theorem applied to this case. So, it says if the signs are different, there must be at least one root on that closed interval. And that's all that says. It's just it's a very specific case where your signs are different. You know zeros between them. You can say for any output, you can give me a specific input on that on that uh, domain on that interval. Would you like to see it in, in application? How you would actually do this? <clears throat> now, of course, we have calculators, right? You just go, oh, let me use my zero button for my graphing, and we'll do it very very fast. Well, let's say that all calculators broke. Isn't that interesting?